Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. So hello everyone and welcome to our first session for the year. Today's presentation is on glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. We have Dr. Kenneth Sag, who needs no introduction. Dr. Sag is a professor of medicine and holds the Jane Knight Lowell Endowed Chair in Division, of, uh, Division in the Department of Medicine. He is Division Director of Clinical Immunology and Rheumatology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and President-Elect of the American College of Rheumatology. Dr. Sag is, was also president, a past president of the National Osteoporosis Board of Trustees. His research focuses on comparative effectiveness and safety of therapeutics, as well as methods to improve quality of care in gout and osteoporosis. He has first authored three original articles in the New England Journal of Medicine on the treatment of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis and on fracture prevention in women with osteoporosis. This is among over 300 other original articles. Dr. Leslie D Jackson has a degree in biology, following which she completed her medical degree at Indiana University of Medicine in 2015. She also undertook a fellowship in global health, um, sponsored by Beth Israel DeConnus Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. And this was in um, Botswana, where she spent some time in Boston as well as Botswana. She's currently a rheumatology fellow in the T32 training program in rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease research, which commenced in July last year. Dr. Sag is her primary mentor. Our moderators for today's session are Dr. Elizabeth Winter from Leiden University Medical Center and Dr. Elena Sordi from Dresden University in Germany. We will have, um, after the presentation, the formal presentation, we will have a dedicated 15 minute question and answer session. So can I please encourage anyone with questions to submit them through our Q&A panel throughout the session. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sag and Dr. Jackson. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. Well, uh, thank you so very much uh, for that nice introduction and uh, welcome everyone from snowy Birmingham, Alabama. I suspect many of you are uh, enjoying a little uh, winter wonderland today with uh, the polar vortex. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to have a chance to address this group and work with uh, Dr. Jackson to discuss glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. As a rheumatologist, this is a uh, topic, uh, unfortunately, near and dear to our heart as uh, we regrettably cause some of this trouble. But uh, needless to say, um, many on this call and uh, uh, who are in the bone field have been very eager to try to think about ways that we can abrogate it as well. So I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Dr. Jackson, who's going to share a case with us and uh, get into a little bit of the, uh, the data supporting some of our different therapeutic approaches. Before doing that, here are some relevant disclosures. Uh, we want to particularly uh, thank the sponsor today, ASBMR, for uh, hosting this webinar. Thank you. Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much. All right. Let's start with a case, one that we're all probably somewhat familiar with. Um, we have a 75-year-old lady. She has a history of giant cell arteritis that was uh, proven by biopsy after she developed um, headache and visual symptoms. And she was started by her ophthalmologist on 80 milligrams of prednisone. She continued to have temporal headaches, proximal myalgia. She had a bump in her inflammatory markers. Um, her ESR is persistently over 60 with each reduction in the prednisone dose. So she's currently taking 60 milligrams a day of prednisone. She's on a little bit of calcium and she has a history of prior lumbar compression fracture with minimal trauma. She has three inches of height loss and she's never been prescribed a bone medicine. Um, notice that the lumbar spine here on her, on her DEXA report um, is actually looks better than it is, possibly because that compression fracture was maybe not reported by the technologist in the report, but you can see her femoral neck T scores. T score is quite low. So um, a little background on the epidemiology. So approximately 2.5% of older adult population age 70 to 79 are on oral steroids at any given time. And of these around 22% are on 7.5 milligrams of prednisone um, per day long-term. And around a quarter of patients treated with long-term steroids um, will develop osteoporosis. 
And we know that prior exposure ever to steroids increases your risk of developing incident fractures um, compared to no prior exposure. At any site, um, incident non-vertebral fractures and incident fractures. So the concern for these patients on chronic steroids is that they'll start out like this, and then a year later, um, they'll you know, end up something like this. So what is the data that we have on steroids at, you know, in temporal arteritis, for instance? Well, one study conducted a few years ago um, looked at steroid therapy in GCA, and they identified patients that were diagnosed between 1950 and 1991 all patients were treated with glucocorticoids and they responded rapidly. Um, the medium duration, however, required to reach you know, a low dose of five milligrams a day was seven and a half months, so quite a long time. And relapses and recurrences were pretty common, occurred in 57 patients. And adverse events associated with glucocorticoids were recorded in 86% of patients. And fracture was one of the most common events noted. So as you can see here in this study, the rate of fracturing was exceptionally high. Um, fracture is a very common adverse event. Um, so, you know, what should we do for this patient? We, you know, we might want to try her on a steroid sparing agent for her giant cell arteritis, but what about her bones? There are lots of treatment options for steroid induced osteoporosis from a number of studies over the years. And Dr. Sag will review some of this data here in a few minutes. Um, but based on the studies that have been done, different groups have come up with different guidelines. And as rheumatologists, we are particularly attentive um, to what the American College of Rheumatology has done. And so we'll go through some of their latest guidelines. So one of the things that the ACR, the American College of Rheumatology, uh, did in 2017 was to decide what a patient should, to decide what a patient should take was to set them up into risk groups. So these are some of our risk groups in terms of category of fracture risk. And this can help us decide um, treatment strategy. So I'll show how our patient fits in here. We have our categories um, of high, moderate, and low fracture risk, also subdivided um, categorized by age. And so in order to be in this high fracture risk category um, for adults over the age greater than or equal to uh, 40, you had to have a prior osteoporotic fracture, a BMD T-score of less than 2.5, negative 2.5 at the hip or spine, and then a FRAX 10-year risk of greater than 20% for major osteoporotic fracture, 3% for hip fracture. So this is where our patient um, would fit. She would fit into this category. I'll also note that the major osteoporotic fracture risk, um, it's been adjusted for the steroid dose uh, based on a formula uh, that was created by McCloskey and, and uh, Eugene McCloskey and John Canis. And so there's a glucocorticoid adjustment um, for patients that are on uh, prednisone 7.5 milligrams per day or greater, basically adds risk. So once we've established the risk category, then we can think about treatment recommendations. And for adult patients that are on PRAD 2.5 milligrams or greater, the 2017 ACR guideline recommends the following. So we start with lifestyle modifications, weight-bearing exercise, um, fall prevention strategies, and then you know, we kind of move on to calcium and vitamin D. Calcium intake 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams daily, vitamin D 600, 800 international units daily. And so additions of, decisions about additional measures um, are sort of guided by triaging that patient into the risk, uh, fracture risk categories. So for adult men and women um, at high, moderate to high fracture risk, um, there's several drugs that have been um, suggested in this particular order by the ACR. Um, as you can see with the strongest recommendation for oral bisphosphonates. The reason they put them in this order is largely based on cost consideration and convenience. We'll get more into that as well. So we have our first polling question here. Um, we'd like to pull the audience, what therapy would you offer this high-risk patient as first-line therapy? Looks like just about everybody has voted. We've got a couple more votes to come in. 
got an interesting mix. Yeah. All right, so it looks like Terry Peritide's the winner, and uh, followed by oral bisphosphonate, IV bisphosphonate, denosumab, abaloperitide, and Romo. And so it looks like overall we have 47% who favored an anabolic, and the remainder favored an antiresorptive. Okay. All right, so let's um, let's talk about um, this option of anabolics as potential first line. So let's discuss the rationale for that. Currently, only teriparatide um, is tested and approved for steroid-induced osteoporosis in the United States, and teriparatide is now available as a generic as well. So um, in postmenopausal osteoporosis, we also have a couple other anabolics um, in the, uh, that are uh, approved, abaloperitide and romazosumab, but neither are tested and approved um, at a large scale um, for glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. So I add these to the list of possibilities because even though this patient does not meet the FDA-approved indications, they might otherwise be indicated uh, for someone with severe osteoporosis, regardless of their underlying steroid use. So let's discuss that more. As I mentioned, the, the ACR has presented guidelines uh, to start with an oral bisphosphonate. So let's think about why that might be and what are the potential arguments against using an anabolic um, as first line. So you might say that it's more costly, somewhat less convenient since they do have to take a basically a daily injection and the indication is for a short period of time. So the use of teriparatide is currently limited to 24 months. And some might feel they're less potent, but we would argue against that. And um, you know, there's some questions about safety, um, but and we'll, we'll talk about that too. And we'll present some data in regards to that. But you know, the question we're asking is not necessarily whether everyone should get an anabolic. We're more wondering if you know, should certain high-risk patients get an anabolic first, um, such as this patient that we presented? So recall those 2017 ACR guidelines. Um, there's different drugs that have been suggested in this particular order. The reason they put them is largely cost consideration and convenience. You know, we have oral bisphosphonates first um, based on cost, safety, efficacy, and then we've got the IV bisphosphonates next. Um, slightly higher risk profile than oral bisphosphonates. And then we have teriparatide listed third, um, listed later primarily due to cost and, and that burden of daily injections, um, as well as the data that was available at the time this was created back in 2017. And so I would argue that in some instances, it's appropriate and indicated to start with an anabolic. So we're disagreeing a little bit with the ACR here, but we'll outline our reasoning um, why this patient may benefit from an anabolic first line in some circumstances. There's other groups that have also put out guidelines for steroid-induced osteoporosis. Here's the International Osteoporosis Foundation and the European Calcified uh, Tissue Society from 2012. And they state that bone protective treatment should be started at the onset of steroid therapy in those patients that are at high risk for fracture and they also outlined several frontline therapies, including bisphosphonates. And additionally, they, they list teriparatide um, as a frontline option for some patients. More recently in 2017, the UK National Osteoporosis Guideline Group updated uh, their guidelines based on a systematic literature review. So we have this table that shows the effect of approved interventions for steroid-induced osteoporosis um, based mainly on BMD bridging studies. And so this is showing not only data on the bone mineral density at the spine and hip, but also mentions uh, vertebral fractures um, uh, risk. And so as you can see, teriparatide actually got better grades than the others, including bisphosphonates, in regards to vertebral fracture risk. Uh, teriparatide got an A for vertebral fractures in comparator studies, which confers a little bit higher level of evidence. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Sack. Well, thanks, Leslie. You uh, did a really great job presenting the case and uh, giving a bit of the evidence. I wanna 
drill down a little bit and um, make an argument, if you will, for why we may want to consider anabolics. And I'll, I'll point out that we discussed this topic with a group of rheumatologists. And I guess I was a little bit interested and frankly somewhat surprised that um, when we asked rheumatologists about this, whether they would consider an anabolic, it was actually 60% that initially favored one uh, compared with 47% uh, here among this group so far today. So I'll uh, share with you a little bit of the evidence and we'll see what you think. So here's some of the data that I'm gonna show you. First, that anabolics have better rationale, that they uh, have better bone efficacy, they may be better when used first, the safety profile we'll talk about. And I'm gonna suggest to you, as I think Dr. Jackson has started to point out that it's not, Every patient that we see with steroid-induced osteoporosis or at risk of steroid-induced osteoporosis that should get an anabolic, but that some patients should be considered for one, such as the patient that uh, we outlined today. So next slide, please. So um, let me take us back and just um, review the pathophysiology. We know that steroids have different effects on bone, they have direct effects on osteoblasts and osteocytes here, mediated by a variety of factors. This leads to a decrease in osteoblastogenesis and reduced osteocyte number, all of which, if you advance, can lead to a decrease in bone formation. And that is really what we think is perhaps one of the primary pathways for uh, steroid effects on bone, and particularly early in the use of steroids. You can see Fractures develop in people on steroids well before there's decline in bone density, and that may have to do with osteoblast and osteocyte apoptosis. On the right side of the uh, diagram here is the effects that steroids have on bone resorption, suggesting a rationale for why our anti-resorptive agents, particularly longer term, may have a benefit. And it also shows the importance of the crosstalk between osteoblast and osteoclast through uh, rank ligand and the impact of that on bone resorption, also supporting a rationale for rank ligand inhibitors such as denosumab. Next slide, please. So this shows us the wind signaling pathway, which is the canonical pathway so important in bone formation. And if you advance, you can see beta catenin when it's not phosphorylated, binding and leading to target gene activation and ultimately stimulation of bone formation. Next slide. Let's look at a little bit of experimentation. This is a um, osteoblast cell line, which um, is either uh, looked at with uh, control media or with control media and enriched with uh, wind. And you can see that when you enrich the control media with wind, you get an increase in transcriptional activity. Now, if we look at that same a model, if you advance and look at it with progressive concentrations of dexamethasone, we see a successive reduction in transcriptional activity consistent with the toxic effect of a potent glucocorticoid on wind mediated bone formation. Next slide, please. Now here is a, a mouse experiment looking at a, in yellow, a wild type mouse, and in green, a souped up mouse that has been made a transgenic for 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase, essentially um, allowing the steroid to be more rapidly processed and having less impact. And if you look at the right-hand bar graphs, you see in terms of osteoblast apoptosis and osteocyte apoptosis, there's a significant attenuation of that in the mouse that has a less uh, effect of glucocorticoid, and that's associated with about a 60% improvement in strength in the, in the, wild, uh, in the uh, green mouse compared with the wild type mouse that uh, doesn't uh, process steroids as rapidly. Next slide. Now, sclerostin is the inhibitor to um, wind-mediated bone formation. And uh, in this animal experiment, we can see, uh, again, a wild type animal and here an animal that is uh, knocked out for sclerostin, sclerostin deficient. And as we expose that sclerostin deficient animal to successive increases in glucocorticoid, you can see that there's a protective effect 
of the knockout in sclerostin. Now, this would suggest not only the importance of the Wnt pathway and the effects of steroids on it, but also that a drug, maybe a monoclonal antibody such as romazosumab that Dr. Jackson will, will discuss shortly, could have a benefit uh, conceivably in, in preventing some of these effects, albeit um, not uh, tested in humans. Here we're looking at BMD in uh, an animal model. Next slide. And if we now turn to humans and look at uh, markers, both of bone formation, osteocalcin, and markers of bone resorption, pyridinylene and deoxypyridinylene, you can see if you advance that there's a significant reduction in um, uh, markers of bone formation, in particular osteocalcin, during exposure to glucocorticoids that goes away afterwards. And while there's a slight trend towards a suppression of pyridinylene and deoxypyridinylene, these effects were not significant, even at a very low dose of prednisone of only 10 milligrams per day. Next slide, please. So what can we do therapeutically? Uh, many of you favored the use of a bisphosphonate. This was a study a few years ago now, looking at alendronate back when we used to give it daily orally. And you can see both 10 milligrams and five milligrams per day led to a significant improvement from baseline and comparable to placebo at the spine and at the trochanter to a lesser degree at the femoral neck. Notice also interestingly that the placebo group, which of course in osteoporosis clinical trials is not placebo, but calcium and vitamin D, had relative stability of BMD at the spine and trochanter. A third of the patients in this study were men, a third had well-preserved bone mass, and you do see a slight decline in um, BMD from baseline and placebo at the femoral neck. So I would suggest that in certain lower risk individuals, we might be okay, at least initially, making sure that their uh, calcium and vitamin D are replete. Uh, next slide. Now, I show you this slide. This was actually a study looking at romazosumab in green, but it's, it's interesting to compare romo with um, teriparatide with the lendronate. And Importantly, teriparatide is an anabolic drug that stimulated bone formation, certainly more so than alendronate, and we also see a slight stimulation, at least initially, and then a plateauing with a romazosumab shown in green, but uh, not labeled on this slide. And that's in contrast with the alendronate, which of course does not stimulate uh, bone formation, but instead blocks a bone resorption and can commonly can have a slight reduction in markers of bone formation. Next slide, please. So that's um, uh, the biologic rationale. We've looked at the suppression of wind signaling, the osteoblast and osteocyte apoptosis, inhibition of osteoblast and osteocytes by steroids can lead to reduce bone strength, removal of sclerostin, an inhibitor of wind provides protection, and anabolics, not bisphosphonates, stimulate bone formation. Next slide. Well, let's look at the efficacy data comparing anabolics with um, antiresorptives. Next slide. And this is the, the phase uh, four study. The, uh, it was actually phase three, phase four, the, the study that led to the indication for teriparatide in uh, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. We see both alendronate and teriparatide led to an increase from baseline in lumbar spine bone mineral density, but that was seen to a greater extent with teriparatide, both in a time point and in an endpoint analysis. Next slide. And we can see a similar effect now looking at the total hip, uh, comparing teriparatide with lendronate. And next slide, what was intriguing in this study, albeit not uh, a priori powered for this, was the significant reduction in a small number of semi-quantitatively assessed vertebral fractures. Next slide. This is interesting because we can look at QCT and do finite element analysis, now comparing teriparatide with persidronate in a nicely conducted European study. And you see that in terms of anterior bending, axial compression, and axial torsion, teriparatide was superior and significantly so compared to residronate in terms of this finite element analysis. Next slide. Now, looking at the uh, finite element strength and anterior bending and comparing that with P1NP, you see that as P1NP goes up, 
so does the, the strength in the bone and um, the ability to resist maximal torque, both at three, six, and 18 months. And most of the patients with teriparatide are to the right in um, this experiment we see with residronate, a clustering of the data points to the left. Next slide. This is looking now at trabecular bone score. And this is something that many of our DEXA machines will now allow us to measure. The top two curves, the solid line and the dotted line is the data I just showed you looking at teriparatide versus alendronate looking at the BMD. And if you look at the two dashed lines, comparing the trabecular bone score of teriparatide at the bottom with the alendronate, what you see is again, there's a separation, but with the alendronate, there was not an improvement at the, uh, in the trabecular bone score, comparing it with teriparatide where we saw a small but significant improvement in trabecular bone score, suggesting different effects mechanically on the bone. Next slide. Many on this call, and I see a very familiar list of uh, individuals that are familiar with uh, microindentation. This has had some fits and starts, but it's an interesting way short of doing a bone biopsy to assess mechanical properties of bone. And if we look at the, in the next slide, the um, small experiment out of uh, Spain by uh, Adolfo Diaz Perez and uh, Melabowski and, and their colleagues uh, in, in Barcelona and elsewhere, uh, although this was this very small study of only 50 individuals, it suggests at least that there may be some mechanical differences with um, patients on steroids exposed to different uh, bone therapies, teriparatide, denosumab, residronate, and just uh, calcium and vitamin D. Next slide, please. So, well, that's all GF data, but we also have the very nicely done Vero study, which is in PMO, and now looks at a teriparatide head-to-head -head with residronate among high-risk individuals. And as Dr. Jackson has appropriately commented on it, even if this patient was not on glucocorticoids, she would still be somebody we would consider at very high risk. And you can see the significant uh, reduction, particularly at 24 months in new vertebral fractures. If we go to the next slide, you can also see in the left panel, the first clinical fracture showing a significant reduction in fractures comparing teriparatide with residronate and a time-dependent analysis and a trend, albeit not significant, towards a reduction in uh, first non-vertebral fractures on the right. So really nice to have the Vero data, finally an active comparator study with significant sample size to show head-to-head -head data in postmenopausal osteoporosis. Next slide. So I've shown some of the efficacy data. What about the timing? The timing is very important here. And this is, I think, a very essential argument that, again, many of the bone experts on this call are very familiar with. If we look at the next slide, we can see that it depends on whether you follow a more potent antiresorptive or a less potent antiresorptive with teriparatide. If you follow raloxifene, shown in red, you, um, you, know, you have less uh, attenuation, uh, you, you see, uh, rather, I'm sorry, if raloxifene is, is in yellow, you have less attenuation in the increase in bone mineral density than you get when you have a lendronate followed by teriparatide, shown in red. Next slide. And then the issue about denosumab. And uh, this is the data study that, again, a, a lot of um, the experts on the call know about. If we look first at the uh, triangles, you can see the uh, desired strategy of following teriparatide with a potent antiresorptive like denosumab, filling in that new remodeling space, very nice improvement, both in the spine, the hip, and the femoral neck. Compare that now with the circles. If you give a, a potent antiresorptive like denosumab, and then you follow it with teriparatide, it may take uh, many months to start to see an, an ability to stimulate that bone, particularly at the hip and at the femoral neck. Next slide, please. So that led uh, Felicia Cosman. I didn't see whether she was on or not today, but we we're all very familiar with her work looking at anabolics. And she suggested when possible, anabolics should be used first line, especially in patients with clinical or radiographic fractures, multiple fractures, 
and those who start with very low bone mineral density. Now, whether you can in the states anyhow get the payers to agree to this is an entirely different story, but at least there is a strong biologic rationale. Next slide, please. All right, what about safety? Well, this conversation's gotten a little bit shorter, hasn't it? We know that if you go to the next slide, uh, there um, have been some registries and large observational experiences that in essence, with now more than 20 years experience with teriparatide, initially as our first approved anabolic therapy, we have not seen a rate of osteosarcomas that exceed that seen in uh, the background population. And that led the FDA just this past fall to remove the black box warning around teriparatide. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, hopefully for those who were um, somewhat unconvinced, uh, we've argued a little bit with some of this uh, more detailed data in the pathophysiology that uh, there's a role for anabolics in GIOP and that some patients on group of corticoids, such as the one we're suggesting, should consider an anabolic first. Next slide. Now, where things get tricky is around cost. And I'm certainly not going to be here on the Zoom telling you that cost is not a big concern. It's a major financial problem uh, for really all uh, of our healthcare programs internationally and a, a huge worry uh, around the rising uh, skyrocketing cost of uh, pharmaceuticals in the US. Uh, and cost should probably be incorporated into guidelines as was appropriately done in the ACR guidance. The challenge that we have is that what we do at a population level is not always the same as what we should be doing at the individual patient level where we're sitting with the patient and we want to avoid bedside ration. We want to try to advocate best for our patient. For some of the rheumatologists who have joined the meeting today, we're in, and many of the endocrinologists too are using now very expensive new biologics and other conditions. We make a decision occasionally to use a very expensive therapy when we think its efficacy clearly exceeds that of other therapies. Now, the good news with regard to anabolics is that we now have a generic teriparatide. The bad news is, is that it's only brought the price down by 25% so far. Next slide. Uh, I hesitate a little bit to show you this one. Um, you know, it's been said that there are three types of lies. There's uh, lies, there's damn lies, there's statistical lies, and then there's cost-effectiveness analysis. So we have to be a little bit skeptical when we uh, look at this kind of data. And this was actually a study uh, sponsored by the manufacturer of uh, branded teriparatide at the time this was done. But what you get here is at least based on the assumptions that entered into these models, if you compare teriparatide with no treatment, in particular, even teriparatide compared with the lendronate based on usual, usual cost effectiveness thresholds of around 50,000 or maybe even 50,000 euros for quality adjusted life here as a reasonable societal threshold. There are circumstances in, in the high risk case being proposed here when this would be an acceptable healthcare economic program. Next slide. Well, the final topic I want to just close on and before turning it back over to Dr. Jackson is the issue of dose. And uh, we're going to think about um, dose a lot here because this is a patient who's already at um, high risk, already had fractures, already has low bone mass. And now we're putting her on a high dose of glucocorticoids, an appropriate dose for her serious inflammatory disease. We don't want her to develop blindness or other serious sequelae of uh, giant cell arteritis, but you can see that as the dose goes up, the risk of fractures goes up incrementally as well. In the next slide, you can see looking at um, market scan claims data and analysis done uh, in collaboration with my colleague, Jeff Curtis here at UAB and some others, you see that uh, this 15 milligram dose threshold is uh, concerning for spine fractures. And if you get above about 5.4 grams cumulative dose, the equivalent of taking 10 milligrams a day for a year and a half, that also constitutes a threshold when you really start worrying about uh, spinal fractures in particular. Next slide. 
And then this is the all tier von Sta data looking at the UK general practice research database showing a monotonic relationship until you get up to about 20 milligrams when there's this inflection point and you really start to worry about developing uh, clinical fractures above that range. Next slide. Now I'm uh, drawn to this uh, very nicely done uh, meta regression out of the, the group in Canada and looking at uh, the control arms of the steroid induced osteoporosis clinical trials, keeping in mind that none of these uh, GEOP studies are adequately powered to look at fracture endpoints. So you really do need to bring them together in uh, the form of a meta regression to really draw firm conclusions. And you can see that for our patient who's newly initiating glucocorticoids, she's going to have about a 5% risk of recuperal fractures, irrespective of some of the other major risk factors that she has within the first year and a lower, but still a much higher than desirable risk of non vertebral fracture. And if you look then at glucocorticoid continuing patients, we see that the, the rate, uh, particularly of non vert fractures, is even higher. All right, so next slide. So hopefully, uh, through uh, this discussion, I've argued that anabolics have a biologic rationale that they have better bone efficacy. They're better when they're used first. The safety profile is acceptable. And some patients on glucocorticoid should be considered for an anabolic first. I'm gonna now, um, before uh, turning things over to Leslie, just uh, point out one of our uh, favorite colleagues in the glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis literature, Juliet Compton, who tells us that oral bisphosphonates are regarded as the first line option on the basis of their cost. However, Periparatide has been shown to be superior in terms of uh, BMD and vert fractures and should be an alternative first line option in some high risk patients. Next slide. Dr. Jackson, tell us a little bit about abaloparatide and Romo, uh, not in regard to GIA, but just about their use and how they might possibly fit in in this patient. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Sachs. So we'll discuss the other two anabolic agents. Um, remember that neither one of these are FDA approved um, in the US for steroid-induced uh, osteoporosis, but there is a biologic rationale um, for both of their use, regardless of whether this patient is on steroids. So let's discuss a baloperatide first. Um, this is a novel synthetic peptide analog of human parathyroid hormone, uh, currently being developed as a potential anabolic agent. Uh, for postmenopausal osteoporosis. And there's some animal studies that suggest it can stimulate bone formation with less of the bone resorption and hypercalcemic effects that you sometimes see with the PTH um, analogs like teriparatide. Preclinical models and phase two studies have suggested that a baloparatide produced rapid uh, BMD increases at the vertebral and non-vertebral sites. And then it produced less calcium mobilization than PTH. This study looked at a baloperatide on bone mineral density at the lumbar spine, uh, femoral neck, and total hip in postmenopausal women. This study was not designed to compare a baloperatide to teriparatide, but both drugs, as you can see here, um, showed significant improvement. So the teriparatide is in the orange. Um, you know, placebo is in pink, and then the various doses of abaloparatide in the other colors. And so, um, you know, they, they both did quite well. Regarding adverse events, abaloparatide is, seems to be potentially less well tolerated. Um, they reported headaches, dizziness, and diarrhea as the most common adverse events. And in some studies, abaloparatide has led to more vasodilation symptoms uh, compared to teriparatide. We'll have to keep an eye on that. And then in regards to romozosomab, again, there's some biologic rationale for this. And as Dr. Sag mentioned earlier, several studies have suggested that for postmenopausal women uh, with low bone mass, romozosomab was found to increase bone mineral density and bone formation and decreased bone resorption. Um, so romozosomab, it's a, it's a monoclonal antibody. It binds to sclerostin increases bone formation. Um, this 2014 RCT showed that ROMO um, here in green at the top um, was associated with significant increases in bone mineral density at the lumbar spine. You can see an increase of 11.3% um, with the 210 milligram dose. 
And then alendronate and terapeutide also increased um, bone mineral density, um, but less so. If we look at the total hip on the right, we see Roma was associated with large increases in bone mineral density there as well. Right. Um, there were mild, generally um, non-recurring injection site reactions with the Romo, um, but otherwise adverse events were pretty similar across um, the groups in this study. So they also looked at markers of bone turnover. And um, we have here the placebo in white and the Romo in green. Um, they found that romozosumab was associated with transitory increases in the bone formation marker PINP and uh, decreases in the bone uh, resorption marker beta CTX compared to placebo. And you can see that over time in the ROMO group, there were increases in bone formation markers at week one, and then they sort of returned to baseline. Um, this is in the left figure. And then for the beta CTX, um, they initially decreased from baseline and then sort of remained below the baseline value sustained at month 12. And so here we have the changes in P and, uh, PINP and beta CTX with our other agents um, also included in this analysis. And it's immediately apparent, uh, apparent, so we saw this slide earlier, but it's very apparent that when you view them superimposed like this, that ROMO seems to behave quite differently than um, traditional agents like um, traditional anabolics like teratide or traditional anti-resorptives like bisphosphonates. It looks very different in how it affects um, bone turnover, in our bone remodeling markers, the, the both markers of uh, formation and resorption. So it's doing things a little bit differently. You can see that Roma has this transient increase, bone formation, as I mentioned, um, as well as a transient decrease in resorption at the same time. So it looks quite different from teriparatide here in pink and the alendronate shown in blue. Here we have the frame study. Um, so this was the pivotal phase three study that established uh, that this drug worked. It reduced fractures and it was the key study um, that led to its eventual approval. They evaluated the effectiveness of Romo Zosumab compared to placebo and reducing new vertebral fractures. And you can see here, they found that it did reduce new vertebral fractures through months 12, reduced clinical fractures um, at 12 months, did not meet the secondary endpoint of reducing non-vertebral fractures at 24 months, uh, there were relatively few adverse events, 5% um, injection site reactions to um, osteonecrosis of the jaw and one atypical femur fracture. And here we have the structure study. So this study was interesting uh, because it was an active comparator against different types of anabolic agents. So they looked at teriparatide and romazosumab um, and you can see that it's clear that these anabolic agents behaved a little bit differently. Um, so they compared these, these agents uh, over 12 months. Um, I want to pay particular attention to the middle figure. You can see um, how the anabolic agents affected cortical volumetric bone mineral density differently. You can see that Romo um, had significantly greater gains in that cortical um, bone mineral density compared to um, teriparatide. And this could have implications for patients where you're particularly worried about cortical bone, um, like at the hip, for instance. Um, so we have the ARCH study. Um, this was designed as a pragmatics trial. It's an active comparator. Similar to what we looked at before, um, we're comparing um, ROMO with alendronate. So it was designed um, to mirror how we might use these drugs in real life. And so um, the primary endpoint was new vertebral fractures at 24 months. Um, patients either received uh, romozosumab or alendronate for the first year, and then all patients um, had alendronate after that. So the figure on the left, after the first 12 months already, there was a statistically significant reduction in uh, new vertebral fractures in those um, treated with Romo. And then on the right, um, those treated with Romo followed by alendronate um, resulted in a 48% lower risk for new vertebral fractures. So quite, quite profound there compared to the alendronate group. They also looked at non-vertebral fractures and hip fracture incidents. And so 
Um, the solid green is the Romo is the group that started with Romosomab. The solid yellow here at the beginning um, are those with uh, alendronate, and then the dotted lines are each of those when they transitioned um, to alendronate. So um, Romosomab followed by alendronate resulted in 19% lower risk of non-vertebral fracture. And then when we look at hip fractures on the right, there was also a much lower risk um, of hip fractures in the Romo group. All right, so looking at the serious adverse events um, in the study, they were relatively similar overall between the two uh, treatment groups. Um, I will point out here in the circle, a total of 16 patients in the Romo group and six in the alendronate group reported uh, cardiac ischemic events. And then additionally, there were 16 in the uh, Romo group and seven in the alendronate group that had uh, cerebrovascular events. So this is the data that led to the black box warning. And it's recommended um, that this therapy not be given to people that have had a cardiovascular event um, in the last year. And the patient we presented at the beginning of this case didn't have um, any cardiovascular history that we knew of. And so now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Sag uh, for some closing remarks. Well, I think I've... Um beat this slide somewhat to death, but um, we've hopefully made the point that uh, we may want to consider anabolics in uh, some of our GF patients, such as the one we presented here. Next slide, please. So uh, at this point, I'll ask you to again vote. Uh, would you consider for this high-risk patient an oral bisphosphonate, an IV bisphosphonate, teriparatide, Denosumab, raloxacin, abeloparatide, or romazosumab. Wow, dramatic. Um, looks like everybody has switched just about that was in the anti-resorptive category. All right, well, um, so we have time now for some questions. I've seen a few come in. Before taking questions, I want to first um, thank um, my co-presenter, Dr. Jackson. She uh, developed this uh, presentation and this understanding of this material while she was uh, covering the COVID ICU. A number of our um, fellows in rheumatology have been asked to help out given the uh, past surge uh, this early winter in um, COVID at our medical centers. And she's also working on a number of research studies that are quite active and uh, I really appreciate her spending time on this and doing what I hope you all agree was really a, an excellent job of um, presenting this material. So glad to take your questions and uh, we'll turn it over to the moderators. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Sag, Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for a really fantastic talk and a really very comprehensive um, overview of glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, in particular use of the newer anabolic agents and how they might fit into the treatment of, um, of this condition. I'd like to pass over now to Dr. Winter and Dr. Surdi and open up the Q&A session. Please, um, again, uh, if you have any questions, type them into the Q&A section and we'll try to get as, to as many as possible. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I would like to echo this. Um, very interesting presentations. Um, uh, there is uh, now dropping in some questions. May I start with uh, a personal question first? Um, when using teriparatide for uh, glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, um, do you, um, and I ask it both to Dr. Jackson and Dr. Saag, do you consolidate with antiresorptives afterwards? Um, and how long do you continue this teriparatide treatment if patients stop their glucocorticoids? Great. Well, um, I'm not quite sure how you want us to take the questions. I'll, I'll be happy, Leslie, to start with uh, this one. And we can, um, you can have a few and pass them back to me if you'd like. But um, yes, I think you definitely want to consolidate after using um, really any of the anabolics, um, be it teriparatide, if you were going to use Abelo, again, not approved for GIOP or even Romo, the uh, recommendations are to consolidate. The question about how long to treat is an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> in this patient, you could make an argument to treat for quite some time because she's got risk factors well beyond her glucocorticoid use. But in other patients, uh, 
where uh, you know you take a young lupus patient or someone who might be premenopausal or not have other major risk factors other than glucocorticoids, there's an argument to be made to stop the therapy. Now, an interesting sidebar is, so let's say you chose denosumab. And we know that if you use denosumab, uh, you know, you need to have an exit strategy. What do you do when you stop that in GIOP? And we're actually doing a study now to try to address that very question about what to do afterwards and what the timing might be of a so-called consolidation therapy. So thank you for that question. And then there is another question from uh, Jude Babir, um, also uh, on the uh, treatment duration. Um, pa patients that are on long-term steroid use, um, do you then even, do you consider a drug holiday at all or do you just uh, keep going? And of course that depends on the fracture risk of the patients, but um, Jude is uh, um, uh, well interested in your opinion on that. So Leslie, what do you think? What would you do? I think it depends on the patient. I mean, I think that you look at their overall risk um, in someone that's extremely high risk. I, I think that I would continue for longer and then potentially do a holiday versus somebody that is lower risk. I might give them a holiday a little bit earlier. Um, it's, yeah. you know, the reason for the holiday is just to reduce the risk of some of these adverse events. <laughs> are sometimes seen. So the atypical femur, femur fractures, the osteonecrosis of the jaw that you might see in bisphosphonates or denosumab. And so, you know, as far as I know, that's sort of the rationale behind doing the holiday. But in someone at such high risk as this patient, I might continue for, for longer than I otherwise would have. Yeah, it's a very nice answer. And um, keep in mind that um, Dennis Black's recent New England Journal paper looking at the Kaiser data and looking at atypical fractures identified a number of risk factors. Uh, you know, it was an observational study, but exceptionally well done. And um, in addition to being an Asian woman, um, being on steroids was another major risk factor for atypical fractures. So I think it is something to think about. Um, I will tell you that the guidelines as they've been written have not um, provided clear guidance on this. Uh, you know, we're really in an evidence-free mode and uh, regrettably to do the types of studies we need would involve randomizing people to continue or stop bisphosphonates. And I just don't think that experiment can be done anymore, even in PMO, let alone in GIO. So we're, we're kind of uh, uh, making decisions based on understanding the pathophysiology without a lot of good clinical data. Thank you. There was another uh, question um, uh, from Barbara Hauser. She questioned uh, with respect to the re reversibility of uh, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. Um, what is your opinion? Should we make a case for steroid sparing uh, treatments like using tocilizumab in the case of, uh, um, of giant cell arthritis <clears throat> as early as possible? Leslie, what do you think? Yes, um, I, you know, we have very strong data that shows that medications like tocilizumab are associated with, you know, improved outcomes in GCA. The problem sometimes is with getting this medication approved, um, especially in older patients that are on Medicare. Sometimes there's some issues with getting IV tocilizumab approved. And so a lot of times that's why we start with steroids and then if we're unable to taper the steroids and they have recurrence or um, you know for whatever reason then sometimes we can get tocilizumab a little bit easier but um, absolutely it would find steroids yeah. very age really yeah and I noticed that there were a couple of other questions about the um, sort of healthcare economics of this whole thing you know how do you get an anabolic fresh out of the gate uh, in the states a very difficult proposition in many patients and you, know, you may have to write letters, you may have to um, have a token exposure to a prior therapy, which um, could attenuate the efficacy of your anabolic, might put your patient at higher risk if you think that this is really a preferred therapy. So a lot of um, unfortunate um, payer issues, if you will, that are not really totally evidence-based and grounded in, in the science of what we're uh, dealing with. Thank you, Dr. Sack. Um, I will continue also on my part. Um, 
great talk and uh, congratulations to you and Leslie. Um, there is a question from Dr. Pop and he refers to the recent study of the letter group, the data HD regimen. So this was in the setting of uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis, but uh, he wants to know if uh, combining teripartite at 40 uh, microgram per day with delayed denosumab could be even more effective in patients at high risk. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see that done. Um, hard to know uh, without the data. There is, um, you know, Felicia's and others have published some data looking at the timing of when um, you give teriparatide with an antiresorptive, and it, it does uh, matter if you have somebody who's been a prevalent user of an antiresorptive with maybe the exception of denosumab, you know, it may be better to add rather than to switch. Um, a lot of um, data, not all um, moving in the same direction here, but we really don't have, to my knowledge, uh, data specific to GIA in, in this circumstance, but it's, it's an interesting proposition. Again, I think the challenge is going to be, you know, being able to get uh, two expensive bone drugs at the same time, and that may be the, uh, the showstopper for, for many of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question from Dr. Tanner um, pertains Romo and fracture healing in GEOP. So I know only of two recent studies in the setting of postmenopausal osteoporosis that weren't so encouraging, but what would be your thoughts? Fracture well, healing. I was hoping Bobo was actually going to give us the answer to that because uh, <laughs> that's a really great question. I'd love to see some of that data uh, in um, Romo and fracture healing, I, I will say that we get a lot of referrals these days from orthopedists. Uh, we, we have a very uh, uh, high-powered uh, ortho spine group or, or a um, uh, ortho sports group here in town that takes care of all the uh, expensive athletes in the U.S. And um, they uh, are often eager to think about off-label use of um, various anabolics to get people back to their uh, you know, million dollar plus jobs. So this is a, a big deal when um, we're dealing with fractures uh, across the spectrum and uh, of uh, particular poignancy with these uh, high priced athletes. Okay, thank you. Another question, which um, I find also especially interesting uh, because avoid apartheid is not um, available for us in Europe. So uh, there's a question about um, a patient who has intolerable dizziness or headache with abel apartheid, um, if he or if your experience would say that he would have any chance of tolerating teripartheid better and vice versa. Right. So I'll, I'll take a stab at that unless we may want to add. But so first of all, I think abelo and carry are much more similar than they are different. Abelo um, likely results or does result in the clinical studies in less hypercalcemia. So that's a clear um, edge there. There may be more vasodilation though with Abelo comparing it with Terry. And so I would think if you have a person who you've um, tried an Abelo but has had some intolerance, it would not be at, at all a contraindication to trying Terry Paratide. And, and moreover, in some of the people that we treat with Abelo, uh, the symptoms may improve over time. Uh, so it, yeah, but it, it can be an issue. Okay, um, we have another question from Dr. Hauser, and this uh, pertains um, non-vertebral fractures. So given the data that you have presented for teripartite and uh, efficacy in vertebral fracture risks, she wants to know if there are any data that anabolic treatment is superior to bisphosphonates for non-vertebral fractures. Um, well, I know we're almost out of time, so let me just, Leslie, I'll just jump in and take this last one, I guess, and we're happy to stay on longer if people would like. But um, yeah, so, th so there's no data. There, there, the data from the clinical trials does not show a uh, efficacy, efficacy signal at all. There is some observational data to suggest, again, some of the Canadian data that it may uh, be efficacious to use the lendronate for non-vert fractures looking at large data sets, being um, cautious though and in interpreting observational data about confounding by indication. But the clinical trials are just way underpowered. We're talking about hundreds of people that take years and years to recruit. 
And it's just not feasible to design a, a large and long enough study of steroid induced osteoporosis to you know, answer non fracture questions in a uh, class one evidence way. But ultimately, that'd be what we would need. And maybe um, you know, we could get some money from uh, <laughs> the feds or somebody to do a pragmatic study and try to answer that. Okay, um, we have just received confirmation that we can stay on a bit longer. So if uh, you and Leslie would be available for a couple more questions, um, we would be happy uh, for that. So there is a question about renal status and especially kidney insufficiency and uh, how does it uh, pan out in the clinical treatment approach in these uh, patients? Leslie, what are your thoughts on that? It's tough. Um, I don't know the options. I don't believe that the anabolics are approved for those with significant chronic kidney disease. Um, so that sort of is limited. And also, Mab, you can use it to a degree. Um, I don't believe that we have great data on those that are ESRD, but we do know that you can use it. As <clears throat> yeah, I think um, there's, there were a number of people on this um, Zoom who are real experts in this area. Mm -hmm. And I would defer to people like Paul Miller, who I saw was, was on here at one time. Um, so yeah, you want to avoid certainly IV bisphosphonates with um, reduced GFR. You want to be very, very careful about um, not treating people that have adynamic bone disease with antiresorptives. There's very little, but a little bit of data to suggest that maybe um, certain anabolics may be OK in that setting. If they're secondary hyperpara, it's probably not going to work. Um, as Leslie said, be careful about tenosumab with um, real bad kidneys due to the risk of severe hypocalcemia. Uh, so yeah, so there's a lot of uncertainty about what to do, but I think you could consider um, anabolics. I don't know that I've seen any good data on Romo in that setting, but it would be interesting to know. We, I will say that we do use monoclonals in rheumatology in people with um, CKD in part due to, um, you know, less worries about the, um, uh, the drug clearance there. So um, lots to learn still. Okay. Um, and maybe another question, because you also showed the study with the TBS. So is TBS something that you incorporate in your decision-making process? Dr. Hawkins wants to know. Uh, well, I, I think my colleague, Sarah Morgan, um, who is past president of ISCD, was on uh, with us earlier. And uh, thankfully, Sarah keeps a uh, good track of our DEXA devices at UAB and has um, helped us incorporate uh, TBS. So uh, that's uh, very helpful to have. And, uh, you know, I started to use it a little bit more. I'm still not entirely sure what to make of um, all the readings and, and how to um, how it changes uh, my thinking compared with uh, just BMD data alone. But uh, I think it does have a useful role and it seems to be an independent predictor of fracture risk. Okay, so maybe one last question. This pertains the increased fracture risk on low dose glucocorticoids. And if I may add, is there any data on inhalative glucocorticoids and how does this uh, uh, fly in the decision-making process. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, a challenge with studying inhaled steroids is it's very, very difficult to find a population of peer users of inhaled steroids. It turns out that just about everybody that's on high dose inhaled steroids is getting periodically bursted with either oral or parenteral glucocorticoids. Some of the older data would suggest that about um, uh, a 10-year exposure to inhaled steroids would on average lead to about a standard deviation decline in BMD. And there is some data to suggest an increase in fracture risk as well. I think the main takeaway with inhaled steroids is that if you have a person particularly using some of the more potent fluorinated inhaled steroids, you need to check bone mass, you need to monitor them over time. There probably is not a safe dose. There's not a dose beneath which we don't need to worry at all about the effects of steroids on bone, but clearly inhaled is safer than oral. And, you know, we've got some nice data that uh, I've been working on with um, uh, Emily Stein and colleagues uh, here at UAB 
on um, epidural steroids even. Uh, so that I think is, uh, is very intriguing and uh, we, we hope to have that data out soon. Uh, intraarticular steroids may have effects on biochemical markers of bone remodeling, old work by Ron Emke from years ago. Uh, so yes, yeah, so there's um, effects, uh, as long as steroids can be at all absorbed into the systemic circulation, they may um, have some very modest effects on bone. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Sack. Thank you, uh, Leslie, for these wonderful presentations. We have lots of questions which we will not uh, address everything, but I think uh, we have had also a lively discussion. And for this also, I thank you. And I would like to um, get back to Dr. Ramchand to close the session. Thanks. Um, again, I'd just like to, to reiterate a um, great thanks to Dr. Sag and Dr. Jackson for today's talk. Um, and I'd like to just, I know we're running out of time, so I'll just end off with this last slide, just to remind everyone that our next clinical case workshop is on Tuesday, April 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be talking about when to stop osteoporosis treatment. And we have Dr. Estelle and Dr. Mattia joining us for that session. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks to the audience for your participation. Um, and that brings us to a close of the session.